Six of crows. Six, six, six of crows. Six, six of crows. Six of crows. Six of crows. Spa! Hello everyone, my name is Victor Rowe. Welcome to Eat the Blank Page. So happy you can join me for episode 25, the one where we get it right. What I mean by that? I mean, lately I've been changing up the format quite a lot and there's been a lot of unpredictability and I apologize about that on my part. This shouldn't be something where you have to guess what you're gonna get. And I'm glad to say that I'm pretty sure, maybe, we have the final rules set kind of laid down. And I already made the new logos and stuff, so I'm not changing the name, I'm not making a new podcast. You guys can say right where you are, but here's what the show's gonna be. Every book that I read, I'm reading to learn from other artists, from other writers, I should say. And one of the biggest things that I wanna do with this podcast is share, share the lessons I learn, share the things that I've noticed, the things that I love, the things that I hate about pieces of writing where I'm a very positive person. I don't know if you can tell, but that is one of the main things I want to focus on moving forward is sharing what I'm learning, but also not losing the same kind of passionate analytical word vomit that I'm, I love to share with you guys. Whenever I record the podcast, I'm mentally talking to someone right after I've watched a movie or read a good book. It is the same kind of energy I want to bring into every single one of these podcast episodes. So you guys aren't wasting your time. You guys are having fun, but you might also learn something too. Maybe you can look at how dumb an actual author is and be like, oh, I knew that. Maybe you write yourself and you you want to find a little bit of confidence to actually go forth and do things. And so so you can compare how much you know versus what I know or what I pick up on and what you pick up on. I love to hear insights either way. If you guys find something interesting about today's topic, Six of Crows, that I didn't mention, I want to hear about it. I want you to tell me because I want to learn too. You know, I want to be the best in the world at this. And the number one thing is that I want writing to not be something for the pompous and the arrogant. I want it to be a community thing. I want stories to be alive again, to be shared again. And that is the main thing I'm trying to do with this podcast is share lessons I've learned and share the stories that I read that I love, but also breathe some life into writing as an art, into storytelling and books and literature, because I love it, it genuinely. And I wanna share it with people, thus the podcast. So the rules of which, um, I can't read a book in a week. I can't, as far as my life goes right now, that's not possible for me. And as much as I for I tried to force it, not working. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, I, I really gave it my all. But this week we're doing Six of Crows. Amazing so far. Um, I've only gotten to page 51. What I'm planning on doing now is taking away the pressure of reading one book every single week. And every podcast, because I'm learning new lessons with everything, I'll show you guys how I annotate. I'll show you guys all that in different videos on my YouTube channel, Victor Rowe Stories, which you can find in the description down below. I'll go into more specific details on how I do things, how I learn, how I take notes. But as far as this goes, I'm going, I learn new things every single page. So maybe there's going to be a couple of podcasts in a row that's the same book because it takes me uh, maybe a month to finish a book. Who knows? Maybe it takes me a week because it's a shorter one or I get really into it or you guys subscribe and I can quit my day job. You know, who knows? Who who fucking knows? (laughs) But yeah, Six of Crows. In my endless freaking struggle to read Six of Crows, I love it. It's awesome. It's probably one of the first, not generic, traditional fantasies that I've actually read where there's magic and like a greater world. There's, I I don't think there's monsters, but it's not Scythe. I haven't read too many books, surprisingly enough, but Scythe is the closest thing I can get to a fantasy where it's mainly a sci-fi. Mickey Seven, sci-fi. You know what I mean? I have all of the game, I have all of the Game of Thrones books. I have not read any of them. I read maybe the first chapter of the first one. And I was like, this is really cool, but I wanna finish 1984. We've all been there. We've all been a dragon every now and again. For those of you who don't know, a book dragon instead of a book worm is someone who collects a lot of books. I didn't know that one. I thought it was really cool because I like dragons and I like books, 
I'm a book dragon. Okay, maybe you can also call it a spending habit problem, but that is besides the point. I wanna sound cool. <laughs> so, Six of Crows, no better place to start than with the beginning. Now, one of the best things that, <laughs> not the best, one of the most poignant things that I'm learning is descriptions. So, in getting reviews for the Doppler house, the one thing that I'm getting back from everyone is that the descriptions are perfect, are so in depth, so there. And it makes you feel like you're actually in the story. That's not me hyping it up. That is just what I've heard from every single other person. But that's the one thing I've heard from everyone else. They all have wildly different things to say about it. Some people like it, some people don't. I personally love it. You go, you should go read it. Link is in the description. There's this I there's this practice that Leia, or if I'm saying that correctly, I hope I am passive description. Now, there are some more on the nail on the head moments of describing things. But let me let me show you exactly what I mean. Page six. I am learning new things on page six. I had no informal training, so you know how surprising can that actually be? But page six, I've learned something already. I actually learned something on page four and five as well, but this is what we're talking about right now. The passive descriptions, the natural descriptions is what we're talking about here. Because for some reason, Leia is kicking with the passive description thing, this is this is the line that made me wake up to the world of how, just how hidden in plain sight a description can be, how natural it can appear. I haven't heard anything. Of course you've heard nothing. Too busy strutting around in stupid purple uniform. That is the first description of color that we have attributed to Joost's uniform. Joost spelt J-O-O-S-T. I don't know how else to say it. That is the first time we are told that it is a purple uniform. And that moment stuck with me and is sticking with me because so many times you'll see writers, you'll see authors go, mm, yes, he looked himself in the mirror, his perfectly pompered frickin' pressed shirt with its purple gleaming in the, in the light, in the meh. No, no, in the purple gleaming in the light, in the... Oh no, oh it's so fancy purple and the pressed coat and the in the mirror he's he's looking at himself in the moonlight. No, screw all of that. By kind of passively giving us what the main color of the suit is, you don't need to describe anything else other than the color at that specific point. Because because right when we have what color it is, we do not need a reminder of the color. And anytime we just we hear a description of the clothing, anytime there is a description of the clothing, we do not need to hear about how cool purple it is. We know it's purple. So if we are told that his coat is shimmering in the moonlight, we are already picturing a purple shine. That is the point. That basic point of getting across something as bold and bright in your mind, visually in your mind, in your mind's eye as color can lend itself to the future descriptions. One thing that a lot of authors forget is that it builds. Descriptions build. You want to give just enough to where it's general. It's where the reader's mind can play with the description. Just enough, but you need the main points of the description to be there. So when I when I introduced one character in the Doppler house, one of the main characters, Benny, I described her as having a tough smile. I mentioned a scar on her eye that's almost reaching for her eyes on the side of her head. And she looked like an Amazon raised by a biker gang. That is Benny. I have not given you skin color. I have not given you the color of her clothes. I have not given you her height but I've said Amazon, so you probably have an idea. I have not mentioned how muscular she is, which she is, which we get we gets into in later parts, but there's a lot of her description of what you see that I didn't say. I gave you gists. I gave you broad strokes with just the, the details that I need you to understand to tell a story properly. And so what's happening here is like an advanced version of that, that I am very impressed by, because when you think about it, it's laying the foundation of something as simple as what color is your coat and 
as we move forward, we never need to be reminded of what color the code is. And if it is, it's brought up naturally. It's brought up to make fun of the purple. It's made fun of, it's brought up because it represents some sort of symbol, some sort of nation, some sort of position or rank. That's the only times it would ever get brought up naturally. So having a character that isn't the one wearing the clothes, say stupid purple uniform, when there was no buildup, it was a description, it was an offhanded description that lent itself very effectively for the future, for the future descriptions, for the future details, for the future moments. If you're surrounded by fire, we know there's going to be some orange mixing with the purple. We can imagine what color that looks like. So we don't need to be reminded of what color it looks like. I, it was one of the first points where I thought that was very, very powerful. And I, I guess we're just going into like the, the literary side of it. But um, here, I'll, I'll, I'll hold it up so you can kind of kind of get a feel for what I do whenever I read. Every single note is just me picking out pieces and trying to find or not trying to find, but just like commenting offhandedly. So I remember why I'm actually marking it. Like if you look here, I, it's a whole chunk, but I, I don't circle it because I, I don't want to mess up you know, the, the surrounding text. Okay, so another thing that right off the rip, right in the beginning, right in the beginning, before we even meet Kaz, before we get to the main people we actually care about, the main characters, this is just setting up one of the main points in the story. I, I never even mentioned that. I never even mentioned that. This is only to give an example for the main cause of the story, which is a drug that when given to someone with powers, enhances their powers like crazy. The, also, I want to talk about that scene. Oh my God, I want to talk about that scene. Holy sh**. But first off, I need to talk to about this dude's cheeks. He's like, it, on his face. Let me explain. The first character that we're introduced to in Six of Crows is my man, Juiced, who is a lover boy. And we find that out at the, at the end of paragraph one. So, I mean, it's not really... A surprise. It's not a spoiler, I should say. Juiced glanced at his reflection in one of the glass panels set into the double doors that led from the house to the side garden. His mother was right. Even in his new uniform, he still looked like a baby. Baby. He looked like a baby. Remember what I said about Benny? She's a tough smile. Amazon raised by a biker gang. It's a general. A general description of the, what the character looks like. So we're not giving you too, too much enough for you to play with. Cause he's not a baby. He's a guard. He's a watchman. He's an adult, an adult that looks like a baby. What does that look like? One of the main factors of a baby is having big old, big old cheeks. Rah! Because like, that's what you would, you would not generally imagine a baby looking like, you know, a little chubber, a little chubber guy. That's the power of this. Whenever, one of the things that I learned is that you can reuse a detail of a character to describe an emotional state, to get across feeling and making the subtext reflect better in the main text. Where it says, Juice turned on his heel, cheeks burning, and strode down the eastern side of the house. Cheeks burning. If you have the context of the scene, there's two other guards making fun of him or teasing him because he likes one of the people at the estate, a girl named Anya, who becomes important later. But his whole thing, his whole deal, as far as we know, on page five is that he likes this girl Anya and people know about it and people tease him about it. So he looks like a baby. Babies have big cheeks. So the main descriptor that is applied to him whenever he's doing something is cheeks are what is described. His cheeks are burning because he's embarrassed. And you understand that because of the context of the scene. It's powerful. It is powerful stuff. When as an author, I'm endlessly trying to find new ways to describe the rain outside, but it's describing is the lifeblood of what writing is. You, it's words on a page. There's no pictures. So having a shortcut like that, that is effective, hones in on what the character is, and identifies the character, identifies the character even in a random setting. You can mention someone's cheeks, fa che cheeks on the face, in a random crowd, and if the reader's been paying attention, which they don't even need to, they understand that it's juiced, because juiced is described by his cheeks, his face cheeks. That is an amazing lesson for me.
because every time I would describe a character doing something, I find myself describing what happens around him. So I won't say, Connor from the Doppler house, one of my main characters, I won't say Connor got into the car. I would say the truck sank slightly as Connor plopped down or something. It's it's a reaction to what's happening. It's It's so that not only do you know that he's sitting down in the truck, but the truck sank a little bit. Everyone's, everyone knows what that is. He goes, he went, oh, you know, give a little sigh of relief. Maybe he was tired. But here, she can just say, hey, he's embarrassed. But it's how it's being said is what's important. And the effectiveness of it, the efficiency of it, of having a something that you can just throw on there the description that people know about, like everything I said before, amazing. Ah, I... Going in my masterclass book uh, for myself. One, oh my God, it's just, there's so much. There's so much, and I'm on page five. I think that's one of the biggest things about writing that I love, about art, about, about anything, I guess. It's when it comes to art and how I think about writing and expressing oneself, storytelling in general, one of the main things I think is important for people to take away is that rarely, almost never, to the point where I'm gonna say never, is it's not what you're writing, it's how you write it. Say it again, it's not what you're writing, it's how you write it. So logically, what's the next step from that? You don't need a good story idea because if you know how to write a good story, the idea can be whatever, a chair in a room. But if you understand how to write a story, if you find a way to write it that is effective and compelling and fun or maybe scary, depending on what you're going for, it, it works. It works because it's how you're doing it, not what you're doing. Uh, this the, to- the telltale sign of a good author, a good writer, a good storyteller is how they tell the story, not what they what they tell. Because there are some good ideas out there written horribly. And there are some bland ideas written incredibly. It is, in in its own self, I think a very liberating thing to realize, but also a very scary thing to realize. Because now, if you feel like you have a good idea, it doesn't matter. The point of having a good idea is that you think it's good. And that you like it and you enjoy it. And so you're going to write it. And other people are going to read it, identify with it appreciate it, but it's only going to be a good story. It's only going to be a good book if you're a good writer. And I'm not sitting here on some sort of prestigious high horse saying that I'm the best writer in the world. I'm going to be. As I read more books, as I pay attention to more stories, that is something I find time and time again, that it is how you do something, not what you do. It is how you tell the story, not what story you tell. Now, getting away from that, uh, Kaz, Kaz, hello, probably the coolest scene, probably an amazing introduction scene. Uh, like I said, I'm only on page 50 of like 400 or something. So hopefully I'll have a bit more to say about the developments of characters. But as it stands right now, the intro sequence where you meet Kaz and you meet the Wraith, I forget her name. I, there's so many names. There's so many names, guys. Guys, there's so many names. And I'm so bad with names. I've always been bad with names. Kaz, so like, okay, Kaz is doing this deal thing in this dock or whatever the whatever the hell. Because his gang runs these docks, but they're like backwater boys. They're like, they're like dirty. They're rough and tumble kind of guys. Real... Sewer rats, yeah, okay. They're, they're, yeah. And so they're having a gang territory dispute because their group or gang run the docks. And Kaz is one of the main people who have helped build the group and gang into what it is and their influence that they have and their territory that they have. And territory is a big thing when you have, you know, groups like that. And (laughs) so there's this place where they meet up. It's this big kind of courtyard area that is considered neutral ground. And they're just talking. They're just trying to figure it out. And if you were to like attack each other in this like honored place, you guys would start an all out war. Everyone would be looked down upon, those kinds of things. Here's what makes Kaz so compelling 
as a character. I'm not gonna go into like the nitty gritty details. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna tell you about it. Kaz is such a badass, man. He is so, first off, he just carries a cane. He's pimp as hell. And he rolls up with this guy who's really good with shooting and there's one real big guy. And he's talking back and forth with this other the gang figurehead person and talking about some stuff. And, and this guy, this poor guy, this poor guy that has to go against Kaz. I, I almost feel sorry for him because he had this whole big thing where he paid off the guards that circled the area. He, 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 was, he had the big guy that was on Kaz's team on his payroll. So he had a snake in Kaz's grass and Kaz knew about it, didn't say anything. Let's, he bribed the guard who was already bribed by the rival gang with more money to be on his team. So the amount of savings that they spent, that the, the, the opposing gang spent on these guards, worthless, because Kaz is, Kaz, Kaz is a baller like that. Pays him off and goes, yep, big guy gets shot. Everyone's like, oh no, except Kaz, except Kaz. He goes, hmm, you're pretty lazy, you know that? What are you talking about, Kaz? <laughs> Your boy just got shot, what are we doing? And he's like, hmm, could someone so lazy be getting up early, going out late, Working extra hours, pretty uncharacteristic, don't you think there, guys? And it's like, what are we doing now? He reveals that the big guy was actually a rat. Mm. And he, he just talks him the entire time. He's just, he's just bad mouthing him the entire time. The other guy that was there, his, his, Kaz's actual right hand man, is like all upset about it. And he's like, no Kaz, no, no Kaz. Very emotional. <laughs> and he's like, ah, oh, we don't need him. We don't need him. And he's got this like Wraith girl who's gonna be important. I know she's gonna be important later in the story. Those of you who have read Six of Crows, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Okay, what does that intro do? It, it shows that he has a check on his emotional state. He can manipulate people. He's rich. He's a forward thinker. He's not intimidated by other people. He knows who to trust and who not to. He deals with those who he doesn't trust and is disloyal to him. And he respects those who are. That's a lot from one, that's a lot from one interaction. And that's not even the end of the interaction. The more they talk, the more vocal he gets, the more angry he gets, the more emotional he gets, but controlled emotion, emotional content, not anger. So as it goes on, he makes up this thing about how he knows the, ex well, he doesn't make this part up. He knows where the rival leader's like girlfriend lives. And he's like, we're gonna torch the building. We're gonna burn her alive, brother, if I'm not out of here in a certain amount of time. And he's like, you wouldn't, you're crazy. And Kaz is like, I think I smell smoke. And like, what the fuck? That's so cool. <laughs> I'm I, I, I'm so used to this idea of fantasy being some hobbits hopping down a trail and Kaz is laying down the law here. I think I smell smoke. It's a funny kind of tormented. It's a it's a funny kind of morbid. And it's just every 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 scene. Every scene with him is like that. As far as I know, I'm getting to the part where the plot is starting. Like Kaz just got the uh bounty to collect the guy and is like the rich guy is like, hey, we'll give you 20 million if you do this. And he's like, oh my God, sure. You know, 10 million didn't sound good. Five million didn't sound good. 20 million, 20 million, it's crazy. You're crazy. The guy goes, two million. He's like, nah, fuck you. Uh, 10 million, I wanna be able to spend the money that I'm gonna die with. And then he hits him with 20 million. And he's like, mm, I can, I can maybe do that. The whole intro is so funny. Uh, because even they, they like leave him to die. Kaz is like, Kaz doesn't kill him. He's like, you know what? I don't even care about you anymore. You were on their fucking payroll. You were a backstab or whatever. You know what? Have your fun, crawl home, get out of here. And the rival gang is like, nah, not, not with us, man. You gotta go find somewhere else to be, blah, blah, blah. So he gets deserted, left there. And then the girl who is like climbing and being a super rogue, 
around the perimeter, taking care of some guards, taking care of some bad guys, like puts him out of his misery, which was a cool character moment too, because we don't really know anything about her. But Kaz being like, from what I can tell, becoming the leader because he has to put together the party. He's in, he's used to a leadership position anyway. You know, like he would definitely run shift if he worked at like a Wawa or a Chick-fil-A or something. He's making like negotiations. He's he's doing the big boy work at 17. Cool. Uh, almost forgot this was not for adult adults. With the new layout for Eat the Blank Page where it's not going to be one and done episodes for each book. There's going to be some more episodes on this. I know last week was Scythe, a book that I've already read before. And, you know, if I feel like it's too much having three podcasts in a row, just be about Six of Crows, I'll throw one in there like that. Let me know down in the comments what you guys think. I think this is the best way to go about it. But the way to help me do more is to show some support, you know, like, subscribe, share, follow the podcast. Let me know what you guys think. Suggest what books to read next. You know, I have a little bit of a lineup, but if there's something that everyone's suggesting, you know, I'd love to actually read it and I'd love to talk about it with you guys. I've mentioned it a few times before, but I'm an author. It's the whole reason I study books and literature and things like that. If you want to check out my work, The Doppler House, it's down in the description below. It's on Amazon. It's going to be an affiliate link. It's going to help me out even more. If you want to get your own copy of Six of Crows, it's also going to be down in the description. It'll say, get your copy of Six of Crows here. Ah, and it'll just be a link to Amazon. So check it out if you haven't. Join the fun. I'm going to be back next week. I know it says bi-weekly in the description. I know I've been very inconsistent, but I'm going to be start doing it every single week. I've reworked some things. I've got it all figured out, guys. We're going to, we're going to be attacking this hard and fast and don't take that out of context. I'm really I'm really excited for the future of the show and to be able to kind of find my community. I want to talk with you guys. I want to experience things with you guys and I want to share the love of storytelling of books and movies and video games and things like that. But that is all the time I have for today. I hope everyone has enjoyed. I hope everyone gets their own copy. Let me let me know what you think about Six of Crows if you've already read it. If you're reading it, let me know where you're at and what you think so far. No spoilers, please. Please, let's be civil. Oh my God. And if you've already read Six of Crows, maybe you'll like The Doppler House, a book by me. Help a brother out. <laughs> Goodbye.